want to talk tonight about something that should be good, the joy of the Lord. If you turn to the book of John, the first chapter, saying, Brother Finch, I thought we were going to be talking about the joy of the Lord. We are. But John, in the first chapter, starting at the first verse, reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the heart of a Christian, the soul of a Christian, this would invoke some joy in us. Amen? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. But we have joy as Christians because we know what that light is. We should have a joy welling up inside of us that it goes out to other people, that it kind of rubs off on them. When we have the joy of the Lord, we should be able to walk into a room where there is grieving And it kind of rubs off on somebody. We need to be able to give that which we have. But we've got to have that joy in us first. But if we read these scriptures, it should give us a cause to have some joy. Because it says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus is life. He was with God at the beginning. He was there in creation. When it says, let us make man in our own image, it was Jesus and God talking with one another. We have him as our Savior. He came to earth. He died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and be reconciled unto him. We need to have some joy because of that. I would even go to say there should be some happiness. We should be happy about that. I know we're not going to be happy all the time, but every now and then we need to get a little excited about the joy of the Lord. Now, joy, as we've talked about before, is a state of being and is not an emotion. Happiness comes, happiness goes. Amen. We're not always happy. Sadness comes, sadness goes. All of these things back and forth. And we have different emotions at different times, depending upon the things that circumstances that happen to us. But joy is a state of being. And what that means is, is that even if I am sad, I have an outlook on it that says that this is only going to be for a moment. We look at this world, and we have seen even more dramatically in the last year and a half, suicide rates going up at an all-time high because of uh, isolation where we stayed in our homes, because of uh, people passing away because of the disease. We've seen uh, suicide rates go up. They were sad and they were depressed. But see, if we could have told them about the joy of the Lord or they had that, then it wouldn't have been the case with them. As a Christian, we look at it and we say, yes, it's bad at this moment. Yes, it might be bad tomorrow. But on the other side, there is glory. Amen? We look at it and we go, I have heaven waiting for me. No matter what is on this earth, 
I have something that is greater than anything that I can think of. The Bible talks about the streets of gold and talks about all the, the majesty up there. But I believe that the greatest thing that is going to be in heaven is the fact that we are in the presence of an almighty God. We are going to be in the presence of the one that said, let us make man in our own image. We are going to be with the one who redeemed us by his blood. It should cause some joy inside of us so that we can go out into the world and give them that joy. I think of the apostle Peter when he walked by and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. What was it? He said, I don't have any money. I don't have anything that I can give you of material wealth, but I've got something inside of me that I can give to you. And I will tell you this, I believe that when we get to glory, I know it might not be this way up there, but if we talk to that man, he says, I'm so glad he didn't have money to give me. I'm so glad that he wasn't reaching into his pocket and giving me some coins. People walk by every day, no doubt, and took some coins and dropped into that man's cup or hat or whatever it was that he had, and no doubt they gave him that, and it kept him going by. It kept him where maybe he could get some food or maybe he could uh, get something, some of his needs. But the need that he had was to be able to walk. And I can't help but think that when he, when Peter reached down there and took him and he immediately stood, I can't help but think that his life was changed and that he gave his life to Christ. But see, Peter had to have that joy inside of him. Peter had to have it inside to be able to give it. And that's what we're going to have to have. But I read these scriptures to let us know why we should have some joy. Why there should be something inside of us. Because of who Jesus Christ is. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. We don't just uh, come here to worship anybody. We come here to worship God Almighty. Let us think about that for a minute. We have the privilege to come into the house of God, to meet with fellow saints, to, as we sing during our offering time, to forget about ourselves, to concentrate on him and worship him that we have that privilege to be able to do that. I am so glad that he saw fit to save me so that I can be able to do that. Are you glad that he did that for you? If you are, there should be some joy. I'm not saying that we aren't, we aren't joyful, but what I'm saying is, is we need to make sure that we kind of stoke that up. The Bible says, stir up the gift that is within you. Sometimes we need to let that stir up and get inside of us and get us kind of riled up. I think about uh, people at football games and basketball games. They go and ever see it, they're out there screaming and they're cheering their team on. They're doing all sorts of things. It wouldn't hurt for us to get a little bit of that in the church because let me go ahead and give you a little insight. We're on the winning team. This is the winning team. The outcome has already been decided. In those sports games, they've got to wait until the end of the game, to that final buzzer, until they know who's going to win. We've been given the outcome of the game before it's ever over. So I'm on the winning team. I can get up and cheer and say, yay, God get up and scream to the top of our lungs that we are that. When the team scores a touchdown or hits a three-pointer, they go crazy. And that's a game and whatever. But when a soul is saved, that's a touchdown. 
I go ahead and tell you, heaven is glorifying it. The angels and Jesus and God up there, they are having themselves a time when one person is redeemed. They've got joy. We need to tap into that and have some joy. We'll turn to the book of First Peter. First Peter chapter one. Talking about that same Christ. First Peter chapter one, starting at verse eight. Talking about Jesus, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We sang that song, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What is the joy unspeakable that we are to have inside of us? Salvation. It's really simple. It's not a big equation. It's not something that we have to sit there and come up with a big uh, doxology about and sit there and write it out and pen it in eloquent terms. It's salvation. It's made so simple that even the most uneducated among us can understand it. That's what the joy is, is the fact that I am not going to go to hell. We don't talk about that enough sometimes. The fact that there is a burning hell and people are going there. Well, I am so glad that I am not going there. But because I am so glad that I am not going there, I should be joyful about that to go give it to others so that they don't go there either. But if I don't stir that gift up inside of me, and you don't stir that gift up, and we don't go and talk to others, and we don't reach out, we might not be able to talk to everybody in person because of different things. But God has made technology. He gave man the idea of creating cell phones, of creating the internet. We can now reach out to people in other countries and talk to them at any time, as long as we have their number. As long as we have a way to get in touch with them, I can reach anybody, anywhere, as long as they have access to the same things. Does that mean that the personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism has gone away? No. It just means that we use the tools that we have because we want to reach out and give that joy to others. And that joy is unspeakable. As I sit up here and preach this message, it's hard to put in words what it is because the fact that we are saved when we deserve death, it's hard to put it in words, the joy of it. That's what it means, joy unspeakable. The fact that it's hard to express to others what it is that you feel. If I were to ask you to put in words, and if you really stop to think about it, you would find it to be at a loss for words almost. The, the most eloquent words that we could pen wouldn't even begin to explain the joy of the Lord. They wouldn't be adequate. All right, give me a minute. They were not to begin to explain it. I can't remember the name of the song. I think it is The Love of God is the name of the song. One of the lines there at the end says, if every man was a scribe by trade, there would, if the sky was paper, there wouldn't be enough to write of God. And I know I'm paraphrasing heavily. But this is the joy unspeakable that it's talking about. If you were saved, you have that inside of you. But Brother Will, I don't know if I have it. If you were saved, it is in there. You just need to stir it up. And that's what we're attempting to do is to let us see through the murk that this world, the enemy 
wants us to be downtrodden. He doesn't want us to tap into that joy. He wants us to be distracted on one thing or the other, to think about this, to think about that, to have my mind focused on this or whatever. He allowed things to come in. But we got to look at him and say, yeah, that happened, but God is still God. He is still on the throne, and because of that, you're not taking my joy. Because of that, you're not going to bring me down. You are the lifter up of mine head. We need to tell God this. We need to tell the enemy that God is the lifter up of mine head. When he comes by and knocks on our door, we need to tell him there's no vacancy here because God is in here. You need to leave. If somebody comes to your door trying to sell something or trying to give you something you don't want, you don't let them in, do you? You tell them to leave. People come knock on my door. It doesn't happen much, especially not in the last year and a half. But they come knock on my door. If they're trying to sell something, I say, no, thank you. I don't want that because I don't need it or I don't want it. Well, we need to do the same thing with the enemy. I don't want what you're selling. I don't want what you're selling. See, the enemy sells to us. God gives freely. Freely you have freely you have received, freely give. We did nothing to pay for the gift, to pay for that joy that we have. We need to make sure we give it to others. going to be fairly short tonight, but if you turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Starting at verse 44. It reads again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. When he finds something that is good, he gives up all of that which is, doesn't measure up. When we were convicted of our sins, we gave up all of that. And we accepted. We gave up all of that which we saw was of no worth. The man here sold everything he had so he could go buy that field because he found something that was better than what he had. When we are convicted of our sin and salvation comes in, we do the same thing. We sell all that we have. We get rid of it. And we go and we obtain it. Why? Because... We feel something stirring inside of us. At first, it is guilt of the sin that we have. That is what draws us. But then, when we cry out the one prayer that God will not reject, a true, repentant prayer of a sinner is the one that he is required to answer. He would say, you saying... God is required to do it. God said he would. There's a lot of prayers that we can pray that we may never get the answer yes to. But if we are with sin, when we were with sin, or those that might be listening are with sin, and we feel that tugging, and we went to the altar, and we prayed, he was going to answer. He put himself to say, I'm going to answer that prayer. Now, there might be some that because of a situation, they might say, Lord, forgive me, but there was never any conviction. But because he did save us, we have something inside of us, and we tell others. Verse 45 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had 
and bought it. Again, the same thing. When we find it, everything that is inadequate, we give up. My old life before salvation was a mess. It was worth nothing. There was nothing of value in it. Brother Will, you, you, you were married before you were saved. Well, my wife is of value, yes. But when I got saved and she was saved, there was something greater there. There was something that was more than what it was, and we don't want to go back to it. Because I try to keep the joy of the Lord stoked in my heart. When we let that joy escape us, that's when we go back. Because we forget what it was. We need to try to remember the experience that we had at the altar when we were saved. And remember that and think about it every day. Especially when bad things happen. Because see... It might not have happened at that moment, but it was going to happen. There was something that was more terrible than what you were going through that you were saved from. When you were saved, you were going to hell. When you, before you were saved, let me rephrase that. Before you were saved, you were going to hell. And after that, you weren't. So whatever you were facing was temporary, and it wasn't as bad as that. This is the type of stuff that we need. We don't necessarily have to tell the person that, but we need to think about it when we're talking to people about Jesus. Think about the fact that he done something for me that nobody else could. He did the one thing that none of you can do. But that joy... Is because we realize what we obtained was greater than what we had. These two examples here, when Jesus was talking, they realized what they had was worthless compared to what they were going to gain. And that should cause us to have some joy. It should cause something to well up inside of us so that we can have a little pep in our step, as they say. So that when we talk to others, we can give it. See, there's another one in there that they go and they uh, think of the uh, woman who found a coin. I believe it was a coin. She searched and searched and searched for it. And when she found it, she went and told everybody, I found it. I found it. Why? Because she had some joy about it. We need to tell others, there is a Savior, and he can save. The world needs to hear the message now more than ever because they need salvation. This world needs salvation. If it didn't, this church wouldn't be big enough to hold everybody. If everybody didn't need saving, that would mean they were saved and they were already in the house. But because they're not, we have some work to do. Let's get this joy stirred up inside of us. And I said I won't go and be long. <laughs> Pretty short message. But the joy of the Lord should stir up something inside of us to give to this world. It should stir up inside of us to give to our brothers and sisters. Because we're going through stuff and we, each and every one of us, have different times and different uh, difficulties in our life. And we need to be able to give some of that joy to another person. Not just the world, but even our brothers and sisters. When they're going through a sad time, we need to be there to lift them up. We need to be there to pray for them and remind them of who they serve. We might think, oh, they know more about God than I do. Well, just because they know more about God doesn't mean they don't need an encouraging word every now and then. Doesn't mean they don't need to be lifted up. Doesn't mean that if you don't do nothing but say, hey, I'm praying for you. It lets them know that you care. And it can stoke, stoke, stir up that joy inside of them. And they can make it through hard times.